Why buy it when you can build it yourself? Yeah, ask my stepdad who built my Barbie dream house when I was nine. In the end, it will all break down to cardboard and tears. Trust me. We've seen it time and time again. Well, I might as well build my own power supply because there's really no way it's going to give me the voltage, tolerances, and efficiency, and form factor I want without me doing it, right? Wrong. Power modules are here to stay. Why mess around with rails, voltages, and current when you could be doing, well, just about anything else? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Now, if you're into that sort of thing, building the most perfect power supply with a ridiculously long list of discrete components, uh, later than normal schedule, and a bit too long bomb out the door, well, you might need to watch something else. <laughs> My guest today is Steve Gocher from Texas Instruments, and we're talking about, oh, you guessed it, power modules. We've got a lot to cover, my friends, so let's get started. And before we do that, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about Texas Instruments' suite of power modules. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Amelia, great to meet you too. All right. I've used power modules before, but for our audience who may not be as familiar, what are they and why do we use power modules? So power modules in TI lingo are where we combine a switching regulator and inductor and often other components into a single package. And the reason we do this is really to help people build power solutions quicker and with less resources than they need to if they use a discrete design. You said they simplify my design. Okay, so let's get more specific. What are the major advantages of power modules versus, say, building my own out of just discrete components? So good question. There are really three elements to it, Amelia. The first and obvious one is solution size. So because we're doing a very optimized design, we're able to build a power solution that's smaller than it's easier for the average engineer to build on their own. So we're able to put the inductor over the top of active circuitry. So the resulting XY area is much smaller than can be designed if you're doing your own discrete product. The other element obviously is ease of use because we do all the power supply design. The engineer using our modules doesn't need to be an expert in power supply design. Plus we provide a lot of tools to make it even easier for people to use our products. And then the third element is also that we have products that are bringing value to the system in terms of performance levels that are important to you. An example is we do EMI testing on most of our modules to meet CISPR 11 or CISPR 22. We do a lot of reliability testing, a lot of thermal testing. So the resulting product is very reliable and meets important specifications. All right, so talking about schedules, how much can I expect to save in my project schedule from using power modules? So that's a really good question. I think it varies from product to product and from user to user. Darnell, back in April of 2012, issued a report and they said it's typically 45% less man hours to do a DC to DC regulator using a power module versus using one uh, doing a discrete design. Wow, okay. This next slide here shows some of the breakdown that Darnell did to show the difference in time and also really the difference in number of steps that have to be carried out when developing a power module. So that study was from back in 2012. Have any major things happened since then? I think we released our first module in 2011, and since then we've released obviously several different products. This slide here shows a comparison of one of our more recent modules against a device that we released a few years ago. The product on the right, the LMZ31710, is a 17 volt 10 amp device. And you can see while we've got the module, there are still a few external components around it, capacitors, input capacitors, output capacitors. The device on the left is a newer product, the TPSM84A21. This is also a 10 amp power module. And the biggest difference here is the number of external components. This device, you'd need just one external resistor, which basically sets the voltage on the output of the module. So this is an example of even in modules, modules are getting easier to use. And this device is clearly a very, very simple product to design with. 
there are so many different applications. So are there different types of power modules for different applications? One of the unique things from TI is we have obviously a very broad power portfolio and we have different ways of developing modules based upon the silicon that we're using and the application that we're targeting the module for. Here are like the three broad areas that we're using for power module development. The left is called an embedded solution. Here we are putting the IC into basically a PCB and putting the inductor or inductor and input output caps on top of that PCB and basically on top of the silicon. The result is a very, very small solution size. You can see on the slide here that these modules are as small as 2.3 by 2.9 by 1.1 millimeter. So very, very small solution size. Typically for lower power applications, this device, today we go up to about three amps for these types of products. The package in the middle is what we call leaded devices. Here you can see it's a bigger package. We've got bigger pins that stick out. It's either a seven or an 11 pin device. We have a big heat sink. So this device is ideal for applications that are maybe lower volume, where customer values a bigger lead pitch, where they need access to the pins. And so this is part of our simple switcher family, you know, truly easy to use products. And then the third style are more traditional QFN products like a regular QFN IC. Here we integrate the circuit either onto a metal lead frame or onto a PCB and then typically we will over mold it to make it look like a regular QFN type device. So many of our new products are in this QFN style package. It allows much higher currents. Today we're up to 35 amps and also higher voltages. We have up to 60 volts of input voltage range for these products. Okay, cool. My application is really important, of course, and keeping power to it is critical. What kind of quality and reliability measures go into these power modules? So that's a good question. And I think one of the things that we often overlook talking about the value of modules is the amount of qualification and design work that goes into the components. You know, we have engineers designing power modules that have been developing them for many, many years, and they are experts in power supply design. So what they do in developing the products is they spend a lot of time choosing the components that we use in the modules, making sure those components are characterized over temperature and over lifetime. We do lots of testing of the finished modules, ESD, shock vibration, thermal tests, power cycling tests. We do board level reliability to make sure that the devices solder well to boards. We do a lot of EMI testing. So we have experienced power supply designers doing detailed work to make sure that these designs are robust and reliable, and in probably many cases more reliable than the average engineer's design that they will implement themselves. So a lot of my concerns in power supplies revolve around thermal stuff. Do you have any data sheet kind of information for thermal and heat? That's an important question. Obviously, we're designing a power module, putting power into a small package size is one of the benefits of our products. And so an important curve we put into all of our devices is this SOA curve, the safe operating area curve. And this really tells the engineer using the module how much power can they get out of the device over the temperature range that their system is going to be operating at. So here we're showing the output current capability of the device over temperature. So here we have some devices degrade over temperature, some devices we have full output power even at 85 degrees C, but it really allows engineers to look at the product, look, to look at their application, understand what derating they need to do, if any, to operate the device at the temperature that they need in their system. Okay, and since we're at Texas Instruments today, I assume we should talk specifically about TI's power modules portfolio. So, Stephen, what kind of options do you have for me? I love talking about the TI power module portfolio. So this slide here shows the breadth of products that we have. And there's some color coding here to show types of packages that we are using at different current levels. So you can see here the dark blue devices are the embedded products. Typically, they're lower current, lower voltage devices. The QFN style products go up to 60 volts and up to 30 amps. The leaded devices are typically higher current, higher voltage products. And then we have some open frame style devices that are typically higher voltage products also. And I noticed some of these have these cool little news stickers. Uh, what's the deal with that? Yeah, so obviously we're very focused on power modules, developing lots of new devices for different applications. And here are five devices that we have released over the last few months, ranging from 
Actually, a device we haven't spoken about today, an isolated module, but products up to 42 volts, products up to 10 amps. So I'd love to talk to you in more detail about some of these products. All right, let's dive into some specifics and uh, look at some highlights for each one of these. Right. So the DCPA series, this is actually an isolated module, very low power. Here we have a product in an industry standard pinout. And this is for applications where you need to separate the output from the input with real isolation. And so this is a low power device. Uh, we have an unregulated output voltage. And this device is great for systems where you need to isolate signal paths, you need to isolate grounds. And we have up to 100 volt working voltage and 2000 volts instantaneous isolation. Okay, what about the next one? The next one is a device we just released a couple of months ago. These are embedded devices. We have a two amp and one amp version. They're actually pin for pin compatible with a product called the TPS82130 that we released a little while ago. This is very, very popular product family. 12 volts and five volts in are obviously very popular bus voltages. With this family, we can get one, two, and three amps of output current in a pin for pin compatible package. Very easy to use, very, very small solution size. And I think the next one was 84203. Yeah, this is another interesting device. It's actually sort of an LDO replacement. So here we made a module using a switching regulator and we put it into a package which has the same pinout as a three pin TO220 style LDO. LDO is obviously good, easy to use, relatively inexpensive, but they're not efficient. And in applications where you need high current and you have a high input voltage, then power dissipation can be a challenge. So this is a module that's sort of a three pin alternative to an LDO and can be used when electronics are being added to consumer type applications. Okay, great. And which one was next? This is a 60 volt and 42 volt in family using sort of the QFN style package. Very, very good for industrial applications where you need a wide input voltage range. The output current goes up to two amps. Lots of features on here, variable frequency, power good, ability to sync the device. A very feature rich device for um, higher voltage applications. And the last device, the TPSM 84A21 and 22, I touched on this earlier. This is a 14 volt in 10 amp output device, really designed for low voltage digital loads. Here, the really nice thing about this device is we integrate everything into the package and we just need one resistor to set the output voltage. Very, very good solution size, only 2.3 millimeters thick, so it can actually fit on the back side of lots of PCBs and people's designs. And even with the integrated capacitors, the transient response is very, very impressive. Okay, cool. Let's do a quick recap of what we've discussed today. So key messages from TI is we've been developing modules for a while. We have a very broad portfolio. Voltage is up to 60 volts, currents up to 35 amps, and in fact stackable up to 70 amps. We have a unique range of packaging options that are really ideal for different types of systems. Performance is very important, obviously size, but also EMI, very few external components and then lots of tools such as WebBent, AppNotes, EVMs to make it easy for people to use our products. And then Mouse is a great place to go to find out more information about the devices that we have. Okay, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Stephen. Yeah, and thanks for visiting today. It's been nice sitting down with you. Before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about Texas Instruments' suite of power modules. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.